Today we look at the reestablishment of the people of Israel after the Babylonian exile with the books Ezra and Nehemiah. This book traditionally was written by Ezra. So who was Ezra the scribe? Ezra was an Aaronite priest. The Hebrew word for priest is Kohen, and that means he was from the tribe of Levi. And he was a descendant of Sariah, and that was the last high priest who served in the original first temple, the Temple of Solomon. He was also a close relative of Yeshua, or Joshua, the first high priest to serve in the new, the second temple. He was living in exile in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes of Persia, when that king, who was very tolerant towards the Jews, sent him back to Jerusalem to teach the law of God to the Judeans. Ezra also led a group of Judeans from Babylon back to the destroyed city of Jerusalem, and he retaught the people the Torah, the books of Moses there in Jerusalem. Now, it can be confusing because originally the Jewish people referred to the books we know as Ezra and Nehemiah simply as Ezra. It was one book put together, and it comes into Greek and Latin as Esdras. Let's take a look at some of the history of this book as a manuscript. The Christian theologian Origen of Alexandria was the first one to divide this book into two parts, and he named it First and Second Esdras. But St. Jerome originally placed them together in one book in the Vulgate, simply called Esdras. And that is how they appear in the Latin Vulgate, Esdras. Now, you sometimes will see 1st and 2nd Esdras in a traditional Bible like the Dewey Rames. 1st Esdras is referring to the book of Ezra, and 2nd Esdras is referring to the book of Nehemiah, or Nehemiah. Now, in order to keep things straight here in the New St. Thomas Institute, I'm going to refer to the traditional 1st Esdras as Ezra and the 2nd Esdras as Nehemiah, just to keep things clear. Now, to make things a little bit more confusing, what Catholics call Esdras, that is Ezra and Nehemiah, is called Beta Esdras by the Greeks. The Greeks also have an Alpha Esdras, which they include in their canon. Ready for a headache? Jerome named this Alpha Esdras as Third Esdras, and he placed it in the Vulgate Apocrypha. Then there's also a book called Fourth Esdras, or the Apocalypse of Esdras, which was also placed in the Vulgate Apocrypha. As if it couldn't get any more complicated, the Protestant King James Version named Third and Fourth Esdras as First and Second Esdras and placed it in its Apocrypha. So there's a confusion about what is First Esdras, Second Esdras, Third Esdras, and Fourth Esdras. There on the screen, you can see the chart clarifying all of this. It's also available in the show notes beneath this lesson. So let's take a look at the book of Ezra itself. Sections of Ezra are actually written in Aramaic, and this is the first time in the Old Testament in which Hebrew is not used exclusively. Now, Ezra led a large body of exiles back to Jerusalem, and when he discovered that the Israelite men had been marrying non-Jewish women, he ripped his garments in despair and confessed the sins of Israel to God. Ezra then did something very controversial. He dissolved all of the mixed marriages. A few years later, King Artaxerxes sent the Jewish Nehemiah to Jerusalem as governor with the mission of rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. After the walls were rebuilt, Nehemiah had Ezra read the law of Moses to the citizens of Jerusalem, and the people reestablished their covenant with God through the covenant that had been given by Moses, as we read in the Torah. And so Ezra is like a new Moses. He reestablishes the law and the covenant of God with the people returning, not from Egypt originally with Moses, but this time returning out of bondage from Babylon. Let's run through the chapters real quick. So in Ezra, the first chapter, God moves the heart of Cyrus to commission Sheshbazar, his other name is Zerubbabel, the prince of Judah, to rebuild the temple. Why is this? Well, the Persians, unlike the Greeks, were very tolerant of other religions, and they simply wanted all the other religions to worship in their own way, but to pray to their gods for the king of Persia. So they were kind of like relativists. So they told the Jews, hey, you go back to Jerusalem, you do the Jewish thing, but when you do, 
pray to your God for me and for my prosperity. That was the deal that was made. And so, of course, the Judean people were ecstatic. Finally, they get to go back home and they get to worship God as had been commanded by Moses. In fact, 42,360 Jewish exiles returned to Jerusalem, led by Zerubbabel and Yeshua, or Joshua, the high priest. And this is a type, again, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we have another man named Yeshua, that is Jesus, who is this new high priest who is reestablishing the people of Israel around the worship of Yahweh in the Old Testament. Now, the people overcome the opposition of their enemies to rebuild the altar and to lay the foundation to the temple. Remember, the Babylonians destroyed the temple and raised it to the ground. There was nothing left. Meanwhile, the Samaritans, who were their enemies, forced the work to be suspended. But in the reign of Darius, the decree of Cyrus is rediscovered and the temple is completed and the people celebrate for the first time with the temple, the feast of the Passover. Now, beginning in Ezra 7 through 10, Ezra arrives onto the scene and he leads a large body of exiles back into the holy city. And this is when he discovers that they've been intermarrying with Gentile women. He says, this is no good. You can't do this. We can't restart Israel if you're all married to non-Israelite women. And so he sends away the wives and he sends away the children. Kind of a sad thing, but in Ezra's eyes, necessary for reestablishing the people of God. That brings an end to Ezra. And now we move into Nehemiah, also known as 2nd Ezra. This is the second half of the original Jewish Ezra's book. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. He is an Israelite man, and he's informed that the city of Jerusalem, although it's rebuilt, is without protection. It doesn't have walls. And so he prays to God, recalling the sins of Israel and God's promise to restore the people in the land. So King Artaxerxes commissions him to return to Jerusalem as the governor where he defies the opposition of Judah's enemies, that is the Samaritans, the Ammonites, the Arabs, the Philistines, and begins rebuilding the walls. And he concludes by canceling all the debts amongst the Jews, having a jubilee year, and he rules with justice over the people. As I stated before, he asks Ezra, the priest, to read the law of Moses aloud to all the people, and then they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days as sort of recommitting the people to the law of Moses. And on the eighth day, they assemble in sackcloth and penitence to recall their past sins, which led them to exile, led to the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, and their enslavement. And the people, again, formally reaffirm the covenant of Moses to keep the law of God. Nehemiah then returns to Susa after 12 years in Jerusalem. And after some time, he comes back only to find that, guess what? The Jewish people have again broken the covenant. And so he enforces the covenant and prays for God's favor. We can also see that this narrative is really centered around three persons. First is Zerubbabel. He rebuilds the temple. Second, reestablishing the people and the law of God. That's Ezra. And then third, building the walls and setting up the sovereignty of Jerusalem, that's Nehemiah. What can we learn from the Ezra-Nehemiah story? I think one thing we can learn as Catholics, as Christians, is that we must be brave, we must be ready to risk, and we must be ready to rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, and restore what has been lost to us. Pope St. Pius X said this, in our time, more than ever before, the chief strength of the wicked lies in the cowardice and weakness of good men. When we look around at our parishes or in our diocese or at the church at large, and we ask, why are there problems? Why are these things happening? It's because of cowardice and weakness. And we look back to this time of Ezra and Nehemiah, and we see that the people of Israel are being attacked, and they don't have the liturgical temple, they don't have the, the liturgy, they don't have the priesthood. All of this has to be rebuilt from what was before. And they're successful in doing it because why? They remain faithful to the covenant. They remain faithful to the scriptures taught to them by Ezra. I want to share this passage with you from Nehemiah. Listen closely. When our enemies heard that it was known to us 
and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind all the house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were laden in such a way that each with one hand labored on the work and with the other held his weapon. And each of the builders had his sword girded at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us, our God will fight for us. It's noteworthy at the beginning of this quote that the enemies of God realize that they have been thwarted by God. And so they conspire to attack the people. Nehemiah is wise and he arranges the people so that half are building and half are protecting with spears, swords, shields, weapons. And even those who are building with one hand, they're constructing with the other hand, they keep it on their weapon. How does this apply to us as Christians, as Catholics today? Well, we must be building, but we must also keep that hand on the weapons. What are the weapons available to us? They are the rosary, the scapular, prayer, fasting, abstinence from meat, novenas, almsgiving, penance during Advent and Lent, ember days, vigils, first Fridays, first Saturdays, sexual chastity, modesty, regular catechesis of our children, and the rigorous study of our theological sources for our Catholic faith. We must attack with sound doctrine and we must be on alert, those standing at the walls, for all heresy and schism. Listen to these words of St. Francis de Sales. The declared enemies of God and his church, heretics and schismatics, must be criticized as much as possible, as long as the truth is not denied. It is a work of charity to shout, here is the wolf, when it enters the flock or anywhere else. Also, Nehemiah explains that the weapon of every single builder was the sword. And we have been told over and over by saint after saint, by pope after pope, that the sword that we use, the sword of the Spirit in prayer, is the prayer of the rosary, meditating on the birth, the life, the passion, and the glory of Jesus Christ through that prayer given by Our Lady to St. Dominic in the 1200s. So here at the New St. Thomas Institute, we began our institute on the Feast of the Most Holy Rosary. That is the foundation, that is the weapon. So I would encourage you, I would plead with you to keep your hand on that sword, on the Most Holy Rosary. Pray it every single day as Our Lady taught at Our Lady of Fatima. And with that weapon, we will conquer our enemies. Why? Because that weapon focuses us on the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. So again, thanks for studying this with us, Ezra and Nehemiah. Keep that weapon close and thanks for being a member of the New St. Thomas Institute.